Come from Jerusalem, peace and God's grace upon all of you. And again, Happy New Year 2021. If you look back at the world events, you just take a review over 2020. I admit it really was a very challenging year, a weird year. But one thing has become absolutely clear this year. Man is not in control of anything. Everything is that shaky, so unexpected, so insecure. What a global impact such a small virus has. World powers are suddenly helpless. Stable economies show how everything can be lost. Most of you know, I begin my messages always with some and few words over the current situation in Israel. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19 plague, that not, nothing leaves us here, in Israel we are in the third corona lockdown. We are in very strict regulation right now because of the numbers of the corona infected daily are still very high and because of the new virus variants. Finally, Israel decided to shut down totally the international airport Ben Gurion. That means no flights in, no out. Israel, a country with 9.3 million citizens, now already with over 3 million people being vaccinated. More than a quarter of the whole population. Yes, one can say as a beating vaccine record in Israel. The world is watching, marveling and praising Israel. More vaccine doses from the US, German Pharma Corporation, Pfizer and BioNTech are on their way to Israel. Some more a million vaccine doses. I wonder, is Israel here a forerunner or more an experimental subject of the world? The new promise of Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu is by the end of the March 2021, all Israelis from age 16 on can be vaccinated. In other words, until the new elections on March 23 and close to the Feast of Passover. But is it really that certain? Compulsory vaccination in Israel? No. But woe those to those one who does not lead, let himself be vaccinated. One could say, without those green vaccination ID cards, no more travel, no more flights, no more visitations in cultural institutions like museum, theaters and others. Sounds like a vaccine apartheid to me. We will see if they will go that far. More and more restrictions, less and less freedom. Yes, cannot buy and sell. We already read about this in the Bible in the end time. Do you see already where all this leads to? There is something sh shady about all this. That's why we also find division among believers. Should we let ourselves be vaccinated or not? Is the vaccination already an end time, apocalyptic, dangerous or not? What are the side effects? Do we really know everything about it, what these vaccines contain that are injected into our body? In Israel, some Messianic Jews 
also let themselves be vaccinated or have already done it. Others are skeptical. We wait first and see. One thing we see already. It anticipates panic and fear among the people. The media become more and more questionable, unreliable, lots of fake news, deceptions and confusions. A satanic conspiracy is behind this or not? We will see sooner or later. But we read in Isaiah 8 verses 12 and 13. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy, let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Yes, we are to be alert, but we are to fear God only. Sanctify him. So much darkness in the world. The suicide rate and the violence increase enormously worldwide. Therefore, it is in our hand. Just in this time, it is our task first to live hope and love ourselves, the light of Jesus, and then to preach it. In the shadow of the, all the negative, we also find some positive news in 2020. Here I mean the peace agreements with four Arab countries, with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco, the so-called Abraham Accord. It is interesting, just while the virus rages, this happens. What, however, in my view, will lead to a, a one world religion in the long run, a part of the new world order. Another thing, how it will be now for Israel without our good friend in the White House, Donald Trump. What will happen with the jointly signed agreements? We don't know. I wish Joe Biden all the best. Back to the Word of God. Yes, just now, when every article, all media, every picture can be twisted, manipulated, we are left with only one option. Back to God's eternal and living Word and lean on it. He, Yeshua, Jesus, is our rock. Let us take deep roots. Like David once said, refresh ourselves at the stream of His spring. But I can guarantee you one thing. The devil will try anything to lead the believers, the Christians in the world, into division. And to mislead them by false doctrines false prophets, which you can see today already, as I wrote in one of my last newsletters. What was the, said by the famous Baptist past, pastor Charles Spurgeon? The root of false theologies is when we belittle God. But I can also guarantee that thereby the return of Jesus is near. We are already in the midst of the birth pains of the Messiah. The more painful it becomes, the closer we are to the joyful events. Yes. So I now come to our sermon, our main topics for this message. The message from Zion, I call it, Bethlehem 2020, from the shepherd fields to the one true shepherd, our Messiah. That's the title of our message. On December 24, 
2020, I went to Bethlehem, especially for you. Now in the corona danger, since it is a red zone city. It was really an adventure tour, but what wouldn't I do for you? We tour guides have special permits to enter those A zones, Palestinian autonomy controlled areas. But at this time, it is also forbidden to us. But we have our secret pass. My wife Oli knows me very well. I love the risk a bit. And she always says I have seven souls. First, we went to the shepherd fields in Betzahor. There we saw the empty store with the olive wood carving art by the Arab Christians souvenir store owner Majid. He said, now let's have a look inside one of those olive wood shops with the beautiful carving art in the shape of the shepherd of the crosses, the manger we find here. We hope one day tourists coming back. Good morning everybody, we are in Bethlehem here, Shepherd Fields. Since 1st of March everything is closed. We are the protector of the olive wood and industry in Bethlehem. And this area, we, uh, the, the only income source is from the olive wood and everything is closed. And we hope that this Christmas everything is changed. God bless you and waiting for you here in Bethlehem. He said to us, on these days, at Christmas, the store would be filled with Christian tourists and pilgrims. But because of the Corona virus, everything is now empty. It's really sad. The Palestinian Authority has paid us nothing so far. No financial help. You in Israel have it good. Your government helps a little. The Arab said to us, and who was also complaining that Bethlehem is becoming more and more Muslim. Today already 70% Muslim, similar to Nazareth. You need to understand, those countries, cities of the House of David, Bethlehem and Nazareth, were originally small Jewish villages, where God made history. Then, afterwards, in the early Christian times, mainly a Christian population, and now it's more Muslim. Majid also said he found no reason to continue to live here. Many Arab Christians are leaving the Palestinian areas. He even spoke of the declining numbers of Christians in the West Bank, not including East Jerusalem, today less than 40,000. After that meeting, we went to the Shepherd Fields Chapel chapel built in the shape of a tent by the Italian Catholic Antoni Barlucci. And so let's go in at the shepherd fields at the top the inscription saying glory to God in the highest here on the shepherd fields 2000 years ago we had the shepherd and the revelation here we're coming closer to the church, to the chapel in the shape of a tent and beneath we find even cave where they had their livestock. So let's go in. We're entering the chapel called the Shepherd Field Chapel built by Antoni Barlucci. Here today everything is empty but we see the beautiful church chapel here with the altar and we will do a circle inside the church here in Betzahu with the still the majority Christian population and we read from Luke chapter 2 where the ch shepherd were outside at night with their sheep and then the angel appeared to them 
saying, Today your Savior is born in Bethlehem, not far away from here. So this is what we see here on this beautiful painting uh, at this chapel, at the shepherd fields. And then it goes on in Luke chapter 2 from verse 8. And then they went all the way to Bethlehem to see what was revealed to them, to see then in that manger, in the cave, in Bethlehem. And we'll go there and see it, how it looks today. And that's what we see here on the picture, seeing how the shepherd coming and praising God. And then from here, they left Bethlehem, going back to the fields here and praising God, what they just experienced. And that's the message from this place. And you see, all this chapel is almost empty. Even those flyers in different languages, nobody picked them up because there are no tourists at this year. And on inside, we see the order of the events of Luke chapter 2. Yes, here we have the whole Christmas story. But what is so important at that place? We believe those are the fields of Boaz, the husband of Ruth the Moabites in the Bible. Boaz, the redeemer of the family of Naomi, thousand years before Christ. Are they the descendants of the shepherds of Boaz who received now this joyful message 2,000 years ago? It might be. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8 on, we read, I'm sure every one of you know this scripture. And we read here, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news, that I will and cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior has born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Yes, this is the good news, the greatest news. We are talking about a city of David, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, translated from the Hebrew house of bread. Here, the bread of life came into the world. But we also read in 2 Samuel chapter 5 that Jerusalem is also called the city of David. How come? How is it possible? Bethlehem, the birthplace of King David and the birthplace of the King of Kings, Yeshua, Jesus. Jerusalem, the place of death of the two kings, but also the place of of the resurrection of our Lord and Messiah. There, I often ask myself, how come that Bethlehem does not play a bigger role among Orthodox Jews today? Like, for example, Hebron, for which they fought very hard in the 70s so that they have a Jewish settlement there established today. But why not Bethlehem? Every Shabbat, the religious Jews singing the well-known Sabbath song called Lecha Dudi, Come, my friend, at the table. A song that speaks about the coming of the Messiah, where it stated, Prepare yourself, my people. Put on beautiful garments, splendid garments. For the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemi, is coming and salvation is near. 
It's interesting that the formal address in their prayers is already correct. They just don't make the connection to the Messiah Yeshua yet. Or how does the prophet Micah write in chapter 5? But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrata, who are to little be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from all from ancient days. Why the emphasis Bethlehem Ephrata? Because there were two Bethlehems in those days. One in the land of Judah and one in the land of Benjamin, where we find also the tomb of Rachel. The Bible verse is one of our strongest arguments when we talk with Jews about the Messiah. Because all based on the Old Testament. Up to the second part of the verse in Micah 5, it could be said, and so we all also are told as a counter-argument, no problem, we are talking about King David. He was born in Bethlehem and he was the ruler of Israel. That's right. But what we do with the second part of the verse, whose coming forth is from old and from ancient days. There they run into problems. You see, in the Old Testament, there are already enough reference to the birth of Yeshua, Jesus. And as you know, we speak to the Jews like Yeshua did himself in Luke chapter 24 on the way to Emmaus of the Torah and the prophets. So do we. By the way, never forget, Jesus never preached a sermon from the New Testament. Now I come to the virgin birth. This is also questioned today by many Christian theologians. You see, false teaching creep in here because God and God's supremacy, Almighty, is belittled. We come to the prophet Isaiah, Yeshayahu we call him, seven years before Christ, the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. He had three references to the Messiah without mentioning the classic Messiah chapter 53. Here I refer to chapters 7, 8 and 9 in the book of Isaiah. First, the Old Testament promise in Isaiah 7, verse 14. Jewish scholars like to question also the fact that Jesus' mother was a virgin. But the original text has the Hebrew word Alma. Is this then referring to a young woman, as they say, the rabbis, or to a virgin? That's the big question here. How it is written? Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and I will call him Emmanuel, God with us. You know, even though earlier interpretations by rabbis still referred this to a messiah, also the well-known Messiah chapter, Isaiah 53. In recent generation, the passage has been understood without messianic reference, indeed and pointing it as messiahless scripture. But we know there are two main reasons that point to the virgin birth of Yeshua. First, the expression The term, the Hebrew term, Alma, in the first translation of the Old Testament into Greek by those 72 scholars, rabbis, 
in the second century BC called the Septuagint, we have the word Alma was translated into Parthenos, the Greek word Parthenos, which clearly stands for the Virgin. The second proof is found in the context of Isaiah 7 from verse 10 to 14, where the Lord challenges the sinful king of Judah, Ahaz, to test God's supremacy and power by sign. What an offer! But when Ahaz refused to name a sign, so God says, Okay, now I will give you a sign. And then he gave himself as a sign, the miracle of all miracles, a virgin gives birth. Think about it. If only a young woman, as they say, becomes pregnant and gives birth, what remarkable, extraordinary symbol would there be? So the original text confirms be it in the word as well as the, in the context of Isaiah 7.14 is about the miraculous birth of the Messiah by a virgin. As it is then later confirmed and witnessed in the New Testament. I add here, how can the rabbi then believe that the matriarch, our foremother, Sarah, at the age of 90, where it is clearly stated in Genesis 18, verse 11, there the way of the woman had ceased to be with Sarah, that she could give birth, but Mary could not. Understand? By the way, as you know, it had to happen through a woman, because in the third chapter of the Bible already, in Genesis 3, verse 15, we read, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel by a woman. This is the final end-time victory of the Messiah over Satan. Then, in Isaiah 8, speaks of the appearance of a great light in the darkness, in the land of Zebulun and in the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, as we read also in Matthew 4. The prophet Isaiah, in fact, knew the map of Israel well, a clear reference to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee at the Via Maris, the way of the sea. And then, finally, in Isaiah 9, we already find the four, and some see it also as the five royal titles of the Messiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. And continues then, of the increase of the government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice, with righteousness, for this time forth and forevermore. Hallelujah. And this brings me back to the city of Bethlehem. Next, my friend, I drove on the 24th of December from the shepherd fields to Bethlehem, as once the shepherds did 2,000 years ago. What we read in Luke chapter 2, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
But today, Bethlehem is no longer the smallest city of Judah. As described in the book of Micah, the prophet. But a Palestinian controlled city with over 100,000 inhabitants. But without even one Jew living there. Normally, on December 24th, it would be packed with thousands of Christians, pilgrims and tourists everywhere. But this year, 2020, was special. Everything empty, hardly any people on the streets. Everywhere there were those road checks with armed Palestinian policemen with Kalachnikov machine guns. The closer you got to the Church of Nativity and the Manger Square, every access for cars were blocked. By the way, I personally know this square, the Manger Square, very well as an Israeli soldier, full of tanks during the operation called Defensive Shield in 2002, when 13 terrorists barricaded themselves in the Church of Nativity. Then we talked with some of those Christians there, some celebrate just in small circles the birth of Yeshua, Jesus. Now to the question, was the birth of Yeshua, Jesus, really on the 24th, 25th of December? That's why I'm glad that we can now talk freely about this after your holidays. Among the Christians themselves, one finds already three dates of the birth of Christ, right? We have the day 24th of December among the Western Christian, Roman Catholics. And then we have 6th or 7th of January among the Greek Orthodox Church. By the way, the Amish people in America also remember the birth of Jesus on this day. Interesting. And then 3rd, January the 18th among the Armenians in Jerusalem. If this alone is not already complicated enough, the Messianic Jews have yet another date for the birth of Yeshua. And here I mean the first day of the Feast of Tabernacle, Sukkot. Long ago, I wrote an article called What Should Be Decorated for the Birth of Jesus? A Christmas tree? or a sukkah hut. Both, as you know, are being decorated. Luke chapter 1 and 1 Chronicle chapter 24, viewed biblically, shed a whole new light on the feast of the Lord's birth. We will see. The birth of John, the Baptist, brings us the date of birth of Yeshua, Jesus. When was the birth of John? According to Luke chapter 1, verse 5, 8, and 9, Zechariah, the priest, was serving in the temple in the priestly work shift of Abijah, Aviyah in Hebrew. And we read here, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. Avia, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, a Levine, and her name was Elisheva, Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God. Those work shifts are mentioned in 1 Chronicle chapter 24, verse 10. Interesting. A priest named Yeshua served in the following priestly division. Always at Christmas, the Gospel of Luke is read over the birth of, right, of Jesus, right? We should always start with chapter 1 and not with chapter 2. 
Otherwise, it is difficult to understand the Jewish connection. Now we see here the shift of Zechariah in the Abijah's shift was the eighth, fixed on the second half of the fourth biblical month called today Tammuz, somewhere in June, July. According to the biblical yearly counting, there were a total of 24 priestly shifts per year. The first one always started with the month Abib or Nisan today, the first biblical month. Each shift lasted two weeks. Then we have at the end of his priestly duty, we read, in the temple, Zechariah came together with his wife Elizabeth, Luke chapter 1, 23, whereupon she became pregnant. This adds up to the first day of the month of July, August. Now, at the beginning of the sixth month of pregnancy, Luke chapter 1, 26 and, 20, and 36, her relative, the Virgin Mary in Hebrew Miriam, became pregnant. This adds up to the first half of the month Tevet, December or January. Mary went with haste to visit her up to now childless relative Elizabeth. Verse 39. And shared her own joyful news. At that time, the journey from Nazareth to the Mount Judea, as it's called in the Bible, Jerusalem, took around 10 to 14 days. You have to understand, bypassing the Samaritans. Many com Mary completed the first three months of pregnancy when Elizabeth gave birth to John. Verses 56 and 57. Therefore, John was born exactly in the middle of the month Nisan, that is, on Passover, the Pesach festival, where in the synagogue on the great Shabbat, the text from Malachi 4, verse 5 is read, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. This exactly happened 2,000 years ago. The forerunner of the Messiah was born, of whom is written in Luke, Chapter 1, 17, and he will go before him in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Another point, Jesus was born six months after John, in the middle, the full moon of the month of Tishrei, at the beginning of the festival of Sukkot, the tabernacle, in Bethlehem exactly nine months after Mary's conception. In the 15th day, in the seventh month of the Bible, in the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacle. Furthermore, now let's see another aspect. The verse Luke chapter 2, 8, also give us here a clue. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. This would not be possible in the winter month. In Israel, in the late December, there are no sheep to be seen outside at night. Just ask a Bedouin. According to the Bible, the Bible scholars, it was a custom to send the flocks out around the time of Passover and to bring them back in before the rains in the mid of October. 
And as you know, we pray and start praying for rain at the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Furthermore, now in matter of season, in the, in the year, since it happened at the Pilgrimage Festival, there was flourishing tourism. The hotels in Bethlehem, in the suburbs of Jerusalem, were fully booked. Today, as if nothing had changed here. Today, the hotels in Bethlehem, in normal times, are also full with tourists. But then they make their tours mostly in Jerusalem. It's just cheaper there. That's why there was no room in the hotels of Bethlehem at that time. Everything was reserved and overbooked. So only a cave of livestock, a grotto, was free. Also, the census on the part of on part of the Romans was very clever at the feast. So all the families had to go to their hometown. For those of you who are aren't still aren't convinced yet, I just remember something else. We know from the scripture that Jesus began his work and his mission on earth in the age of 30 and carried it out for three and a half years up to the crucifixion, right? We also know that Jesus was crucified on Passover and then resurrected three days later, right? If we count back 33 and a half years from Passover, we exactly reach the Feast of Tabernacle, the birth of Jesus. Yes, one day Jews and Christians will also celebrate this feast together, the Feast of Tabernacle, as it is written in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14. Actually, it's not that important whether our Messiah and Redeemer was born in Sukkot or in December. But it would be more accurate. We should believe approvable, I always say. Nevertheless, the message remains valid, relevant for eternity. We conclude looking ahead, but starting in Bethlehem. The prophet Ezekiel writes in chapter 34 from verse 23 on, creating the eternal link between David and the Messiah. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them. And then three chapters later in Ezekiel 37, the well-known chapter of the vision of the valley of the dry bones, we read at the end, my servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd. Ro'eh echad in Hebrew. They will live in the land I give to my servant Jacob. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. Hallelujah. And David, the Messiah, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make the, a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Yes, beginning with the shepherd's fields, all the way to the one shepherd, the one king, who will rule over the whole world, the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. As Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
So we come to the conclusion. With God's ultimate goal for the world, where we will be once His people, and God Himself will be our God. Through the birth of Yeshua, the light has come into the world, and an eternal covenant of peace has begun. Let us therefore spread the message of peace especially in those days. God bless you all.